I suppose some of us ask that question in uh, uh, more solitary uh, moments, but certainly all of us uh, are searching for a sense of purpose and meaning. There's a book up here I want to show you. Um, it's by um, uh, a continental a psychiatrist called Viktor Frankl, who was uh, uh, taken to um, uh, four concentration camps during the Second World War. And um, he wrote his memoirs afterwards. He lost his pregnant wife. She, she died there. And his parents and children. He was the only one who survived. And he subsequently wrote this book called The Search, Man's Search for Meaning. It's a beautiful cover, isn't it? Uh, and it's been one of the top 10 bestsellers, certainly in the US, uh, over the last uh, 20 years. One of the things he says essentially in the book is that uh, he thinks Freud, for those who are interested in uh, psychiatry and psychology, he thinks Freud got it wrong. He, he says that Freud argued that the determining factor in our search in life is the search for pleasure, rather like you saw in uh, Alfie's reflection there. He says actually, Frankl says, no, it's deeper than that. What most people are looking for more than uh, the experience of pleasure is a search for purpose and meaning. I suppose we all want a sense of significance, but even in the uh, internet age, when there's so much communication, sometimes we feel small and insignificant. Let me read to you something from Freshers Week in the University of Illinois. Some of you have just come through Freshers Week here. Imagine if you received this uh, email uh, coming up to uh, Bath University from the authorities of here. Uh, authorities here, University of Illinois, dear number 344.280430, we have a personal interest in you. How you'd feel uh, if you read that, uh, read that in terms of your own sense of personal significance? Well, different people have grappled with this search for significance, and you may sense that uh, or feel that some of the quotations I'm going to offer now are fairly negative. But they're highlights from people who have lived a little bit longer, who are reflecting on a search for meaning and purpose in life. One comes from the Times newspaper. It's a Jewish columnist called Bernard Levin, who died of cancer just a year or two back. And just before he died, uh, he was an atheist from a Jewish background. And he wrote, countries like ours are full of people who have all the material comforts they desire, together with such non-material blessings as a happy family, and yet lead lives of quiet and at times noisy desperation, understanding nothing but the fact that there's a hole inside them, and that however much food and drink they pour into it, however many motor cars and television sets they stuff it with, however many well-balanced children and loyal friends they parade around, it aches. Well, you may feel that that's the cynical reflection of a man in his 60s who's a about to die, but let's take Michael Schumacher, famous sportsman, who you would have thought would find his sense of uh, purpose from playing, uh, from being one, probably the greatest Formula one racing driver of all time. When well, he won his fourth world championship, Lewis Hamilton has just won his third, he said, winning the driver's championship was great, but there must be something more to life than that. You often find people when they reach the top of their professions, that as they reflect on reaching the top, uh, they sense that there was something missing. I read in the Financial Times just not too long ago, a little box quotation in the center page. It was an investment banker who had become a multimillionaire, and he wrote, all my life I've been trying to climb uh, the corporate ladder. And he said, when I got to the top, I realized I was climbing up the wrong wall. So he was a very staggeringly wealthy person. Or Bob Geldof, whom you all know, the guy who set up Live Aid raised many millions of uh, pounds and dollars for uh, people in tough areas of Africa. After he raised all this money and distributed it to needy areas, he wrote his autobiography and it was just entitled, Is That It? Is That All There Is To Life? Have I Fulfilled My Purpose? There was this sense of anxiety, as it were, that not everything... Uh, had come together. Or a former pop star, I won't mention her name, but she's a woman who wrote in order her autobiography recently. She was famous in having relationships with many of the famous rock stars, uh, particularly in the 60s and 70s. And now she's looking back. Uh, she's over six years of age. She wrote this. 
when you've run the whole gamut of experience and eaten all the forbidden fruits and found uh, their sweetness turning sickly sour on the tongue, what's left? As Viktor Frankl himself said, we have enough to live with, but not enough to live for. Or take the comments of the student scribe in the, uh, in the toilet, in the Radcliffe camera in Oxford University. Uh, that's where I used to read history every day for uh, three years. And I was visiting again as a former student recently. You probably don't look at graffiti in uh, toilets. You're probably too civilized for that. But I did anyway. So I was uh, in the loo and I saw four different scribes had written something on the wall. And one of them had written, four different guys uh, in the solitude of this cubicle. I spend eight hours working each day. That's probably more than some students. Scientists, I think, probably work more, as do lawyers. But historians don't. I spend eight hours working each day to get money to enjoy life. Then somebody else had written, and written underneath in different handwriting. And I spend eight hours sleeping each day uh, in order to get rest to enjoy life. Then a third person had written underneath. And I spend two hours eating each day to get energy to enjoy life. And a fourth person had written underneath. And I spend six hours each day escaping from life. Now, someone wrote a bestseller just in the last 10 years, Neil Postman, his, Postman, his name was, trying to comment it's his observation. Again, none of these guys I'm referring to are Christians now. And he wrote his book, which was a bestseller uh, in the last 10 years. It was entitled, Amusing Ourselves to Death. And in a way, that's what we see in the story of this young man here. He says to his father, look, I've had enough of living in your shadow. I want to be set free just to make my own choices and amuse myself. Now, what is interesting about Jesus in the Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and feel free to take this one written by Dr. Luke home to read for yourself, is that Jesus invented a form of storytelling called parables, where he tried to bring home spiritual truths. And the essence of this story is he's trying to portray what it's like when men and women try to live independently or without reference to a creator God who's made us, who is also a heavenly father, what the repercussions would be. And in the first part of the story, he's implying that the father in the story is a kind of picture of uh, God as a father. And just as the son seeks to be free of the influence of the father, so human beings seek to be free of uh, the oversight of God himself. So uh, I suppose most people, when they think of purpose and meaning, uh, God doesn't come into it. One pop star again said, I don't go to church. Well, I, meet, you meet, I mean, you meet such cranky people who do. I'm sure it was all right in the beginning, but surely not now. But by contrast, an eight-year-old boy who wrote in his little diary, I often lie awake at night and ask myself, what's the point of life? Now, in this story, Jesus, as I say, is trying to highlight what it's like if we try to live without reference to God. Now, you might find or you might sense that you feel quite contented with your purpose and direction in life without reference to God at all. What is intriguing, however, I know that most of you are scientists, is when you talk to the people who study the humanities, and especially when you read what the humanities, the artists, the philosophers, the filmmakers say, who are not Christians, about what people's life is like if there's no God who is there. I'm going to give you four or five quotations. Before I do, let's just uh, flip up two other images. These are the refugees in the refugee crisis. Look at that powerful statement. We're not going back because we lost everything. We're not for trade. We are human beings. They're looking for purpose and significance and contentment in life. And then another one. See if you can recognize where this is. See, do you recognize where that is? It was there just a few months ago. It's Tahir Square in Cairo. And you remember, uh, probably just a few years ago, students like yourselves and many young people, vast majority there are under 25, demonstrating for freedom of choice um, uh, in the Egyptian and Islamic context. Of course, it's all uh, come to nothing. Many people would say now you have the disaster uh, going on all through the Middle East. Let's look at the next one. 
Uh, I'm going to offer you now four quotations then of people uh, who come from the world of the humanities who are trying to comment on what it's like if there's no God who is there. Before we hear the one from Fellini, let me quote this one to you from Albert Camus, who's one of the great French philosophers of the last 50 years. An atheist, till very close to the end of his life. Some people think he became a Christian. I don't know, but he said this. Up until now, man has derived his existence from his creator. But from the moment he consecrates his rupture with him, he's given over to the fleeting moment and the wasted sensibility. And then this, this quotation from Federico Fellini, who's seen a film by Fellini. Uh, this is uh, an advert for his book, La Dolce Vita, The Good Life. Uh, he's, written, he's produced a number of other brilliant films. In fact, the Times did a survey of the greatest filmmakers of the 20th century last year. And the top three, none of them were Americans or British. Fellini came in as number two. Uh, Antonioni was a, came in as number three. And uh, um, a Swedish guy, Ingmar Bergman, was voted as the greatest filmmaker of the 20th century. Why? It's because these guys tended to do what are called art house films, which are reflections on the meaning and the purpose of human existence. After he'd produced this film about the good life, portraying what the good life might be like, Fellini wrote these words. I just do film to make others see that today we are naked and more defenseless than at any other time in history. Like many people, I have no religion. I'm just sitting in a boat drifting with the tide. Now, you may not feel that yourself. But what I'm saying is that the people in the humanities and the arts and the thinkers, they push us to the logical conclusion of uh, facing what life is like if there's no God who is there and we are left alone in the universe. Even Brian Cox, who's on television, the photogenic... Uh, scientist on television these days who used to be a rock star in the future wrote an article recently in which he said we have to accept that we're all alone in the universe if there's no God who is there and it's very solitary let's move on this is Francis Bacon uh, of whom Margaret Thatcher famously said that man who paints those awful paintings this is a painting of him of the screaming Pope uh, it's called a pretty negative view of uh, the church certainly uh, but uh, Francis Bacon, again, wasn't a Christian. And he was pushing the boat, boat out in terms of explaining what life is like if there's no God is there. And he said, man now realizes that he's an accident, a completely futile being, but he has to play out the game on the stage. Echoes of Jean-Paul Sartre, the next one, uh, who actually said man's absurd, but he must act as if he's not. I was living in Paris when he was teaching in the 1980s, one of the most famous thinkers or philosophers of the last uh, hundred years, I would say. And this is a quote from him. Here we are, all of us, eating and drinking to preserve our precious existence. And there's absolutely nothing, no reason to exist. What all these guys are saying is, if there's not a father, creator God who is there, and we're left to ourselves, what then is the purpose of his existence? Is it to produce memories? Is it to produce the legacy of children? Is it to produce great books? Is it to have an ephemeral love affair? Or what's the purpose if there's no one who is there? And the last quotation comes from a famous British writer, Somerset Maughan, who wrote this. If one puts aside the existence of God, one has to make up one's mind. What's the meaning of life? If death ends all, I must ask myself, what am I here for? And how must I conduct myself? Now, the answer to these questions is plain, but so unpalatable that no man will take it. There's no reason for life, and life has no meaning. Now, I won't go any further, because I'm sure <laughs> the, the conclusion of all those quotations can leave some people feeling rather depressed. In the world of thinkers and the humanities, what some of these guys say is, what this leads to, if you reject the existence of God, which is a fairly recent phenomenon in the history of the world where large sections of uh, society are saying there's no God who is there who has created us or who is a father who cares for us or to whom we're accountable we're left to ourselves we're free to do what we want but we're left to ourselves uh, what this tends to lead to is some measure of discomfort 
sister-in-law said this when she was studying English literature in Sheffield University. She wrote to me and said, I, become, I thought I'd answer the big questions of life studying English literature. But she said, we've avoided them. University gives me spokes, but no hub, no centeredness. And she left university relatively disillusioned. In Germany, they've, uh, they have a word for this. It's, uh, it's the word uh, homesickness. There was a great thinker called Helmut Thielicke a few years ago who said, modern man is just homesick. He's gone away from uh, his father, God in heaven, as it were. He's distanced himself. He senses that something's not quite right. He can't put his finger on it. But he feels homesick. And the Germans came up with a second word. They said one of the things this leads to is Sehnsucht, a sense of longing. Uh, the French had another word I studied in Paris, and there they used to talk about ennui, a kind of sense that uh, things are not coming together, are not complete. In Wales, we have the word hiraith. Welsh people usually use it when they're living away from uh, Wales in a foreign country, like England, and they're desperate to get back. They're missing home. They're homesick. There's this longing to get back to the country. You can often see it when Wales are playing against England in rugby or somewhere else. This kind of longing, over-the-top uh, singing and almost worshipping of the rugby team. But anyway, this word hiraith doesn't just mean a longing to return to the home country, but it also indicates a sense of longing for something that's lost. So you see, do you see the sense of pathos in all these quotations? These are great thinkers, but most of us don't live like that. As one other thinker said, what, the way that most modern men and women live in the early part of the 20th century is their primary concern is for personal peace and affluence. That's what dominates the thinking of many people. But he went on to say, actually, you can't stop there. You have to face these realities of what life is like if there's not a God who is there, who, is created us, who cares for us, and who loves us. Now, Jesus is trying to portray this in the story of this young man. He takes the money from his father. He goes and spends it on wild living. And his friends are fair where the friends, they leave him. And he ends up in a pig pen, sharing food with the pigs. And he comes to his senses at that time and thinks, uh, maybe I should go back to my father. The people he's got as servants are much better off than I have. I'm going to return. And we're going to find out in a few moments what he found when he returned to his father because that highlights what happens in terms of our own sense of significance and purpose when we return to God as our Heavenly Father. But before uh, we do so, I'm going to invite Dom, if he'll come up here uh, first of all. And I want to ask him a few questions. Dom is a, a footballer, star footballer. He plays for the university team in Oxford. He's come to join us for a few days. He's leaving late tonight because they're playing Cambridge in a big game uh, tomorrow. But before he goes, I thought we would... Uh, Interview him. Have we got we got one of these mics? Yeah. We got one. Well, Dom, tell us um, this story of the this uh, young guy. Can you see anything of yourself in it? Can you identify with it at all? <coughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, like you said, I'm, I love football. Um, I grew up thinking that football, I guess, was my identity. So, um, becoming a professional footballer meant pretty much the world to me. I thought I'd become like, amazing. Everyone would like, sort of love me. Everyone at school loved me for being pretty good at football. So, yeah, I guess I have my value, my significance in that. Yeah. But well, what happened then? Did you okay. did that last? or? Uh, no, so um, I used to be really, really small. Um, I got released at 16, 17, which is the age where I either become a professional footballer um, or you don't. I then got sat down by my parents about a month later and they said that they were getting split up. Um, so I'm not from a Christian background. Um, and well, world sort of just fell apart. So I started doing whatever, whenever, with whoever. Uh, to the point where I ended up getting arrested, um, throwing a car, throwing a cone through a car window is not a good idea, it turns out. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, um, that happened. I got quite depressed. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then my church back home in Nottingham um, built a new youth centre and it had a five-side football pitch in it. So I purely started going as a group as it just went down to, to play football, really. Um, and then the youth pastor was a really lovely guy, amazing guy, and he started chatting to me. 
about where I had my meaning in life very much so like tonight um, and he offered to pray for me and I was like yeah sure um, so he started praying for me and I just burst burst into tears and over a period of about six months every time someone prayed for me I would like cry all the time I still cry now and everyone, anyone prays for me and I was like what even what am I crying so much and um, he talked to me about Jesus and about the significance of what he'd done on the cross and how my identity was actually in that and not in in football and yeah after doing a lot of crying I eventually just felt like a weight lifted off my shoulders and just felt washed from the inside that's probably the best way I could describe it and and yeah and he was just saying that that football doesn't define you that you know a son of the king in heaven and I was like what does even that mean I was like what um like that you're a son uh, of God that I've was dead and now I'm alive is what it says in the Bible I'm like that's actually quite a a big deal that it says that I'm a, a prince in his kingdom and I realised that actually kicking a football round kicking a football round on the field isn't the be all and end all. Isn't really the reason why I'm actually here. Um it didn't stop so you enjoying you still playing football well, and enjoying massively. it obviously but it's it's not quite the dominant force it was in your life, is it? Sure. Oh yeah massively up for tomorrow's game. Came Brazil get absolutely battered. Um but yeah, yeah. Uh, so are you are you centre forward, are you? I am. Um, I'll yeah. try to be anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. After tonight, with the amount of cake I've eaten, it's probably not a good idea. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, if we lose, obviously I'm absolutely gutted, but as in it doesn't ruin my day um, like it probably used to. And if we win, um, or if I score a few goals, I try not to be so big headed as I probably used to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, where does your sense of purpose and meaning come from these days then? Okay, um, great question. So, yeah, having my identity in knowing that I'm unconditionally loved. Um, knowing that I absolutely gave nothing to God when I came to him, knowing that a 16, 17 year old lad doing whatever, being arrested, had no reason for God to come after me whatsoever. And so yeah, I just want the rest of my life just to make Jesus as famous as possible, to know that the, like, the grace, the unconditional love that I received is available to absolutely everyone. The fact that he's been able to use me the past three years since I've been a Christian, he's definitely able to use any of you guys in this room, that's for sure. So, okay. yeah. Right. Thank you very much. No, Thank Thanks. you. Cheers. And all the best tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, that's one of the great things that the Bible teaches about the God who reveals himself in the Bible. You look in vain for the notion of God being a loving God in any other world faiths. One of the ways in which the Christian faith is unique is its revelation that God is a personal and loving Father. Now, I recognize that some folks, as in Elle's case, as we heard it earlier on, might struggle with the notion of God being a loving Heavenly Father because they've had a bad relationship with their earthly father. Maybe that's your, been your experience. Uh, I have the story here of uh, Julian Lennon, the son of John Lennon, the famous uh, who wrote his autobiography a few years ago at 50 years of age. About two years ago, I think he wrote it, uh, Julian Lennon. And in it, he wrote about his experience and his relationship with his father, John Lennon. And he writes this. You may know that John Lennon divorced Julian's uh, mother, Cynthia, who died last year, and he married Yoko Ono and had another son uh, by him. I saw my father, he said, only a handful of times. When I did, he was often remote and intimidating. I grew up longing for more contact with him, but felt rejected and unimportant in his life. Dad was a great talent, uh, a remarkable man who stood for peace and love in the world, but at the same time, he found it very hard to show any peace and any love to his first family, my mother and myself. Now, some people may have experienced that uh, in life. And so it's very hard to then get to grips with the notion of God being a loving Heavenly Father who loves us unconditionally to whom we could return. But that's what Jesus is saying here. And that was Dawn's experience and Elle's experience, as she highlighted uh, earlier on. One of the other features about the love of God which is revealed in the New Testament is that God's love is a reconciling love. In other words, he welcomes back those who are long lost, as it were, who are wrapped up in themselves. And that's at the heart of this story. Uh, the father really, uh, you, could, you, could, uh, uh, you, you could accept it if the father said, look, push off. You haven't bothered with me, with me for years. You disrespected me by asking for half my money before uh, I died. You've wasted it in a foreign land. Now you've got the cheek to come back and say you want to be welcome home again. I don't want anything to do with you. But actually what you see in this story is that the father's love is not only unconditional, but reconciled as he welcomes the son back. I had a wonderful story, true story on these lines when I visited Thailand not too long ago. There was a young guy who went to university at 18, didn't get on with his parents at all, and uh, studied in the University of Chiang Mai in the north of the country. Didn't contact his parents for 10 years. Uh, the relationship was so poor. But as often happens, as we get older, we begin to understand why our parents are the way that they are, and maybe become a little more forgiving and understanding. As he approached his late 20s, he thought, I wonder if my parents are still alive. I'd quite like to really to reconnect with them. So he decided to write to them in the hope that he would be welcomed back into the home if his parents were still alive. This was the pre-email generation when uh, if you had wanted to send a quick message, you sent a telegram. Your parents can tell you all about those. They probably had them in their weddings. So he sends a telegram to his parents, and in it he just says, returning home, if welcome, put white handkerchief in the tree. And he couldn't wait for the response, so he caught the train to his parents' home. And he wrote that telegram in that way because the house backed down onto the railway line. It's an 18-hour journey. Caught the overnight train. Uh, now, you know, if any of you are Asians here, if any folks from East Asia here, you know that East Asian cultures are shame-based cultures. So the one thing you never do in Asia is you never shame some, somebody in public. You always give them the way of escape. You always give them a let out. In other words, you never humiliate them publicly by saying, you idiot, do you see what you did to me uh, years ago? You're no longer welcome. You'd never see an Asian parent really doing that uh, in public. And so this young man, because he was uh, uh, of uh, ethnic Chinese background, he wanted to have the opportunity for uh, his parents to uh, reject him without having to face them uh, face to face. That's why he thought, if there's no white handkerchief in the tree, I'm not welcome, I can just carry on and never see them again. But if there's a white handkerchief, I'm welcome, I can go knock the door. Anyway, the train trundled on, and uh, he became more and more nervous, part in fear, part in shame, bowing his head, uh, biting his nails. He couldn't look up. An elderly man was sitting opposite him with a shock of white hair. He said, what's the problem? He recounted the story to him. And uh, then he bowed his head again, fearful of rejection. The train trundled on. He went past the bottom of the garden. The elderly man looked up. The young man didn't. 
the elderly man then tapped him on the shoulder. He had seen the tree. And as he tapped him on the shoulder, he said, you can look up now. There's no white handkerchief in the tree. But there are three white blankets blowing in the wind. I think your parents are saying, you're reconciled. Come back. That's the message that screams to us from the New Testament. God is saying, I love you so much that I have opened up the opportunity for you to be reconciled to me. Unconditional love, reconciling love, sacrificial love. Because the New Testament tells us, how do we know that God loves us? God commends or shows his love towards us in that while we were sinners cut off from God, he sent Christ to die for us. The idea of a father giving a son as a sacrifice for people to be reconciled seems very strange to many people. So let me briefly comment on that. Why did God the Father send Jesus to die on the cross to take the punishment that we deserve? It's because we live in a moral universe and because God is a God of justice. All the students I talk to these days crave justice. They want justice to be seen to be done in the law courts. They want MPs to be held to account. They want the police courts, policemen to be held to account. They want sexual abusers to be held to account. But if there's a God who is there, they say, and they want him to hold these men and women to account, you can't then say to that God, you hold other people to account, but not me. God must be free to judge everybody equally. And because he's just, he must punish wrongdoing. But the problem for God is not only is he just, he's merciful and a God of grace. He wants us to be reconciled to himself. So how can he punish injustice and wrongdoing while opening up a way for reconciliation? There must be a perfect sacrifice. What does God do? Only God is perfect. Man is sinful. Man's done wrong. Man must pay for the sin. God becomes a man in the person of Jesus in the incarnation, goes to the cross, take the punishment which we deserve in his body on the cross, which opens up the way for reconciliation. In other words, God's is costly, but it's not cheap. Because he had to pay for it himself in the substitutionary death of Christ in our place. But God's love is also satisfying. It satisfies our deepest needs, as we saw in the story of this young man. I remember being in India once and asking a woman who had become a Christian from a Hindu background, why are you a Christian in a culture where most people are Muslims and Hindus? And she said three reasons. It's only through Jesus Christ I can have a relationship with God as Father. It's only through Jesus Christ and I can have my wrong doings or my sins forgiven. And it's only through Jesus Christ and I can, I can have the hope of heaven. Those things, she said, are unique, uh, uniquely expressed through the work and the person of Jesus Christ. Well, that's the first thing that the young man discovers when he returns to the Father. Is unconditional love. What Jesus is trying to say is, if we're living in a universe or a world where we deny the existence of God and cut ourselves off from him, then we are cut loose and there's this ennui, there's this uncertainty, there's a sense of uh, lostness. But we can experience God's unconditional love and the purpose that comes with it, as Dom shared, when we return to God as our Heavenly Father. But there's a second thing the young man experiences, and it is forgiveness. Now, someone has said, uh, one philosophy lecture in Finland actually said, nobody who is unforgiven is free. Now, I meet many students who say to me, I don't need to be forgiven for anything. I don't feel guilty at all. Uh, many people have hard consciences. How would we respond then to this incident that happened some years ago uh, in the life of Arthur Conan Doyle, the guy who wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories? Again, it was the age of uh, telegrams, and he wanted to play a trick on MPs. They were just the same in those days as they are today. So he sent a telegram to 18 members of parliament, and the telegram just read, everything's been discovered, flee the country. They all caught the first boat from Dover to Calais out of the country, but he didn't know anything of their private life. Uh, now, if that had happened to us, how would we respond? I have to tell you, the older you get, you know a clean conscience, which is not seared by guilt, is one of the greatest gifts you can have in life. This guy hasn't got it. Let me tell you about him. His name is Gunter Grass. If you're not uh, in the humanities, again, you won't be aware of him, but he's one of the great European writers of the last 50 years. He's won the Nobel Prize for Literature, one of only two Germans to do so since the Second World War. Uh, he's from the left wing politically. He's not a Marxist, but he calls himself a socialist. Since the Second World War, Gunter Grass 
has made it his task to publicly out people who were members of the Hitler Youth or the SS Waffen, who were supporters of Hitler. And some of them are prominent people in German society. He's outed them and he's ruined reputations. Some people even committed suicide as he exposed them, as they tried to hide what they did in the Second World War. Then, lo and behold, two years ago, he writes his autobiography at 87 years of age and is called Peeling the Onion, Pulling Back the Layers of One's Life. And in the autobiography, he makes this astonishing confession. All my life, I've sought to out people who were supporters of the Hitler uh, leadership in Germany. I was myself. I was a member of the Waffen SS. When his friends read this, they dropped him like a ton of bricks. They said, you raging hypocrite. You've ruined the lives of other people and their reputations. And you actually did it yourself. And then when he was exposed, right at the end of his life, and his friends left him in the last two years, he wrote this. It was weighing on my mind for 60 years. It had to come out. But it will stain me forever. Why does he say it will stain me forever? Because if there's no God who is there, where do you find forgiveness? Again, a great humanist of the last 50 years, a woman who's called Marganita Lasky, brilliant lecturer. And I really respect her for her integrity and honesty and directness. She was broadcasting on Radio 4, and she said this. I was astonished at what she said, her integrity and her directness. She said, what I admire you about you Christians is your forgiveness. Because I do not believe in a God who is there myself, I have no one to forgive me. I mean, she said, I carry my sins around with me all the time. Now, where do we find cleansing, forgiveness for uh, wrongdoing? It was Mark Twain, speaking of Western man, who said, Western man is the only man who blushes and ought to because of some of the things that we do. Where do we find forgiveness for the things that stain our lives, the muck in our lives, uh, as it were? When I was uh, studying in Paris, I remember there was the trial of a, gr of a very famous uh, terrorist called Carlos the Jackal. Uh, back in the 80s, he was famous for blowing up uh, different parts of Paris and elsewhere. He was from Venezuela. And he was tried and imprisoned. And his lawyer was a guy called Verges. And in his defense of Carlos the Jackal, he said this, speaking about all of mankind and the fact that he wasn't so different to other people. He said... In the hearts of even, uh, of even the worst criminal is a little garden which can be tended. In other words, a capacity to generosity and tenderness. But he said, in the hearts and the souls of even the most upright, upright men in society is also a cesspit. In other words, he was saying all men and women are glorious ruins. And that's how the Bible describes us that we reflect some of the glory of being made in God's image, which is why, whether we are followers of the God of the Bible or not, we have the capacity to engage in philanthropy, kindness, generosity, affection, love. It's God's, if you like, common grace towards us. We, are, we reflect something of the glory of being made in God's image, but we're also ruined, which is why we engage in wrongful acts and are in need of forgiveness. It's folly, therefore, for some people to say, I don't want to return to the God of the Bible as my father and trust in him because he'll spoil my life. That's exactly what this young man, sa young man said. Whereas I think Jesus' answer would be, your life is spoiled already. And actually, it can be, you can experience restitution and reconciliation and wholeness and purpose and fullness if you return uh, to this God who is your father and creator. We're coming towards the end. The third thing that this young guy discovered when he returned to his father paradoxically, was that he was freest when he related to the Father who brought him into the world. And that's what the Bible tells us about freedom and the Christian faith. It seems a contradiction, doesn't it? For some people, they think freedom and Christianity is, is not the kind of equation I would have thought of. But actually, the, Jesus said, when you find the Son, that's Jesus himself, then you are really free. Now, if I were to ask 100 students in Bath University, give me one word that describes to you what the Christian faith is about. Almost none of them would say freedom. It's actually what Jesus said, that you can be free when you discover me and return to uh, my heavenly Father. 
Our problem is the Western world is driven, if it's driven by anything, it's driven by a desire for freedom. But there are two competing notions of freedom. The one comes from a period in history in Europe called the Enlightenment, about 250 years ago. A group of philosophers, thinkers led by people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, said man who is born, born, in ch uh, born free and he's everywhere in chains. He must be set free to make his own choices, do whatever he wants. The problem is you can't live like that. But that is how many people would like to live, to be free without any hindrances. Usually they say, so long as I don't hurt anybody. But you can't live like that if you want to be free to do exactly whatever you want. It usually leads to desolation and the breakup of relationships. Talk to anybody who comes from a home where there's been divorce because of adultery. Because people have said, I want to be free to sleep with whoever I want. I've met almost no one who comes from such a background, including in my own family, who've experienced that, who said, yeah, yippee for freedom. Let them carry on. That's freedom to do whatever you want. But that's the notion that dominates the Western world. But there's a second notion of freedom, which actually comes from the Bible, which is that we have freedom within a framework of the teachings which Jesus has given us. Let me put it like this. Supposing we went to the Bristol Channel and we put a fish in the water there. That fish could swim the oceans of the earth. It can swim for thousands or uh, uh, tens of thousands even potentially uh, kilometers. In the environment for which it was created, it exercises choice. As soon as you take the fish out of the environment for which it was created, it dies. It's similar to us. God created us for a loving relationship with him where we can exercise a lot of choice. But as soon as we divorce ourselves from the God who has created us, something happens and we die spiritually. And uh, in this story, what we are seeing is that when the young man returns to his father, he experiences genuine freedom. Freedom from guilt. Uh, freedom from bad habits. Freedom from meaninglessness. As one great historical writer said, uh, our souls are restless and only find their rest when they are in you. Freedom from uh, fear. It always intrigued me in Paris that very few hotels had a, had a 13th uh, story because people were so, in that highly secularized culture, uh, they were so uh, suspicious. Uh, but it's not only freedom from, it's freedom for, to enjoy a loving relationship with God as our Father. And that's where this comes in. This is a piece of sculpture, sculpture, sculpture by the great Italian sculptor Michelangelo, who also painted the Sistine Chapel. Uh, I'm sure you recognize that that's an image of Christ there being uh, held up by this man in the background. And it doesn't take much to guess who that man is in the background. It's Michelangelo himself. Just a few months before he died, he kept very good diaries. A few months before he died, he'd had a kind of nominal attachment to the Christian faith. But he not understood that real freedom comes in returning to God as Father. He wrote these words in his diaries, just not his diary not long before he died. When I am yours, O Lord, only then am I truly free. He discovered freedom. So that's the third dimension to the restoration of purpose, which the young man in the story and we experience as we return to God through Christ as a heavenly as our heavenly Father. And then lastly, the fourth thing he discovers, again this is a shocker. Joy. Right at the end of the story, the father says, my son was dead, he's now alive, let's celebrate, let's have a party. We're having a party tomorrow night with the hog roast. To celebrate, to highlight the joy of the Christian faith. One of the distinctive defining features of authentic Christian experience in the New Testament is almost inexpressible joy. I've been a Christian now for 45 years. I was an international sportsman. I was in the Welsh football squad at 17 years of age, but I was really arrogant about how good I was. I was very self-centered, and then I encountered the claims of Jesus Christ. I recognized I needed forgiveness for my overwhelming arrogance and pride. I became a Christian. That was 45 years ago. I haven't honestly regretted it for one second in 45 years. And I would say one of the defining experiences of following Jesus Christ and returning to God uh, as a loving Heavenly Father is joy. And this is what this young woman said in a meeting like this in Swansea University after she took that step of turning to God through Christ. I'll never forget the day I accepted Christ as Savior and Lord. 
I was simply going through life as a blind person. Now I found joy and purpose in Christ. Last two slides. Where are you in the story? Are you in the first part of the story in rebellion against the God who created you, the loving Father who brought you into existence, who uh, desires to show you compassion and for you to experience the fullness of being his children, or are you in a state of rebellion? Or are you in a position where you are coming to your senses or reflecting and thinking, well, this may be true, but hold on, I need a bit more time to reflect on this. If you're in that position, I'd encourage you to take this biographical account by this medical doctor, Luke, who was a contemporary of Jesus, who wrote about his life, just to reflect on the question, could Jesus be who he claimed to be? coming into the world to show us what God is like to die for our sins? Or could you be in the situation where you sense, maybe I want to return? And I'm like the guy in the story who returned to his father and was surprised by joy. I actually want to do that too. I recognize that I don't have a deep sense of purpose and meaning in life. I can identify with what El and what Dom said earlier. And I want to have an experience very similar to them in returning to God as Heavenly Father. This is what you do, very simply. Last slide. Just go to God and say, thank you for the invitation to the party. I'm sorry I fouled up. Sorry I rejected you. Sorry I went in my own direction. But I accept the invitation and I return to you. So it's, if you like, two T's. Turning and trusting God for what he's done in and through Jesus Christ. That gives us a sense, when we do so, of wholeness and fulfillment, a fresh sense of purpose and direction. doesn't mean we stop being interested in sport or sex or food or any of these good gifts which God has given us, but rather at the center of our lives is the delight of a relationship with Him as a loving Heavenly Father, just as this son experienced as he returned to his father in the story.